theme of make is really not a big stretch for me. I make art. Um, I am a uh, sculptor, primarily, that's what I call myself. Um, but uh, making plays a really significant role in the whole process. There's design, there's craft, there's concept, but uh, it's important that I continually distinguish the role that making has in what I do to help evaluate <coughs> how things are turning out or where they're going. This first image is from the Botanic Gardens here in Denver. I installed a piece uh, this summer for the Catalyst exhibit. And it's a very simple piece. A lot of people, at first glance, or walking through it, didn't really get it. And there isn't too much more to get other than there's these lines uh, in the landscape that I established. Um, but it's a shadow line. And it's a, a series of vertical elements that at midday every day, from the fall equinox on, would align to stitch a line across the landscape. Just a simple idea, but it, uh, it comes from a early work, one of my first kind of explorations just on the beach, and I did several of these. This was a winter solstice, just uh, aligning shadows across the, the beach with nails that were there. And um, that, that process of just going into a site, going so somewhere, becoming familiar with it, engaging with it um, in a manner like this, something simple, efficient, um, and, uh, and yeah, creating a moment um, and there's a clear uh, association with someone I apprenticed for. Uh, uh, Andy Goldsworthy was one of my first employment opportunities right out of school. The idea of making, I can't talk about making today without talking about how he so profoundly influenced the way I just approached the process. That, um, you know, we would work on these larger projects too, but he does make daily, or that's his goal. We all get distracted, but uh, you know, yeah, I had just graduated from industrial design, so to go to a position where I was, uh, you could kind of see the balls of mud, but you know, I, I went from a design studio to collecting mud and shit, mixing it together, <laughs> so he could press it against a tree, and it's uh, it's it, it's it's just almost a way of purging some of the the bowl shit that I learned in school, but also how I process that. And how I returned back to um, what, what making, what the role making played and what I was doing. You know, a lot of these works, there's no preconceived uh, notion or idea of what we were going to go make. Um, and w we would just show up to what location he had in mind and respond to it. And a lot of times that's what making is. Uh, it's a response. It's, it's an action. It's an activity that uh, you, you, it involves design, but you're also trying to disassociate from uh, some of those, uh, those ideas to allow the process to just inform what you create. This was an uh, early work I did in a grain silo. Um, sometimes it's hard to see what it is, but that's the sky. <coughs> the, bl the blue circle is the sky. And uh, spent three days on a ladder with a spool of nylon string and just kind of circumscribed this, uh, the rim of the silo, uh, bringing it down to almost the ground and uh, creating what almost became a lung. Uh, it was a piece that obviously captured the light, but also the air. It would, it would breathe and it would uh, kind of move with each uh, breeze that would pass over and through the silo. And um, these works were really important because they did, uh, they allowed me to just make. I didn't go into that silo having an idea what it was going to create. In fact, I thought it was going to be very different. And uh, all the string was under tension. And when I released it, it was this surprise. Of, like, you know, uh, it showed me what the silo was going to provide and what the architecture and the volume of this space was going to create. Um, so I continued to explore with these. This was just in a barn in Iceland. And uh, this piece was really all about the light. Um, it's really simple. Once again, I'm just stringing up uh, wool yarn in a, in a sheep barn. But there's this uh, tremendous uh, force or attitude during this month on the farm. We were about to go into shadow for about four or five months. So as they were gathering all the sheep and kind of harvesting the fruits of their labor from the summer and uh, preparing for this shadow that uh, kind of drives everyone <laughs> into this dark depression, um, I was thinking, well, I'm going to harvest light. 
I'm going to like harvest the sunlight that comes into the, the barn, and just as a metaphor. But uh, I wasn't really going to do too much for him on the farm. I did try to help, but uh, <laughs> I was just an artist. So <laughs> it was just a statement and an idea of how could you collect the light? What, what, could that, um, what would that look like? And once again, what is the architecture, the, the dimensions of this barn going to create? Um, this was a cable installation at the Gallery of Contemporary <laughs> Art in Colorado Springs, at the uh, University of Colorado. And this one was really, uh, well, it's more synthetic. It's, it's, uh, it's predictable. The, the lighting was all set up and staged. Um, it was far more about the architecture and the volume and the mass and the delicate nature of uh, yeah, these pieces when they're brought into a room. It, it's very different from uh, the silo piece, but uh, it, it enforces the space you're in. You know, these galleries are these white cubes, these rooms, uh, kind of void of too much detail, intentionally. I mean, because you want to see the art. But, uh, so you start to approach these pieces um, almost as another, uh, another member in the room. Um, you navigate around them, uh, you can touch them. They, uh, they command a, a proportionally a large amount of space and um, you almost expect them to be heavier uh, with the form and actually I mean that much string is pretty heavy but um, <laughs> it has this very delicate light cloud like um, feeling when you're there and uh, so uh, there's a little more here with uh, touching it but yeah it's a very different piece uh, you know, that tension just between the floor and the material itself. And then, of course, it all just comes down later. Um, I try to save them, but they get all tangled. And <laughs> there's, it's, someday I'll figure out what to do with all this string. Uh, um, and these are incredibly labor intensive. As far as the role of making with these, really they are, uh, I've tried to do the math with them, and they are just, it's all about just making it into place. I'm sure there is some calculus I could follow to figure out. Now this was uh, a piece, um, it's in City Park. It's, a, it's on the perimeter of the zoo. And it, it's derivative of those works, uh, but this is steel. Um, uh, kind of drawing from the sense uh, of the zoo and steel bars, but then taking it further and creating this delicate uh, feather, feather-like form. Um, these were all made in my studio. Uh, this was my first attempt at, uh, attempt at designing something that I could have someone else make. But um, what I come to find with these big commissions often is that no one else is going to be able to make them as efficiently as me because I've designed them uh, with that in mind, how they're going to be made. And instead of just bringing another fabrication firm up to speed on how we could really do it efficiently, I just hire on people and we do it. Uh, every, every piece was rolled in my studio. It's all uh, salvaged steel pipe, uh, just sprinkler pipe from around the region. And um, yeah, we rolled and welded each one. There was a fair amount of design, solid works, CAD work that went into it. But um, that's one example of uh, making a large piece. Then I take them to a much smaller scale. <coughs> These are about the size of your palm. They're just uh, bound, wound uh, forms, uh, working with the string in a very different way. Uh, this was sort of a response to uh, the landscape in Iceland once again, where there's a tremendous amount of scrap steel left over from the US military from World War II. It just kind of left everything there. And over the years, the Icelandic landscape has started swallowing it up. So you'll see these I-beams or tin just kind of jutting out of the, the ground. And of course, on all these pieces of metal, there's, there's wool clinging to it because there's so many sheep. And you see it everywhere. I mean, if you've grown up on a farm, you see the evidence of the animals everywhere. And uh, so yeah, there's all these, these white tufts of uh, this, you know, fiber connected to these harsh, rusty pieces of steel. And this was just kind of a response, a way of containing that, and uh, maybe a record 
a quick, efficient, easy, uh, simple piece. But um, another uh, idea of, or uh, example of how I work on a smaller scale, just making these were seat backs uh, from a furniture maker here in Denver. They were going to be thrown out, and really the shape. The dimensions, the scale, everything about it is derivative of the seat backs themselves. Uh, simply screwing them together. I did go to the extent of gilding the inside because I realized there was this containment of light once again. And um, the way it bounced, it just kind of settled in the form itself. But uh, This was a good exercise in kind of letting go of designing ahead of time, drawing it out, or aiming towards something and just, just making. Just uh, cutting and making and screwing together. Plenty of splinters. Um, this is a clay, it is a little dark, but a clay box. And it's actually a clay urn. And I've made these in the past. I haven't done too many lately, but um, it's just raw clay intended for the ashes to be put in it, left in the landscape or dropped in the water, whatever, melt away. Uh, it, uh, obviously, this is a very personal work, but um, you know, when you think about, well, someone's body is going to be inside this box, it gets very personal. In this passage, this little opening where that, those ashes will go, all these little details, as simple as they are, just a square, become really profound. But um, it's just a clay box, just raw clay, that, uh, hand built. Um, there's nothing to. Uh, technologically amazing <laughs> outstanding with it. But uh, I have made about three for people that have died. And the idea of someone calling you up and asking you if uh, you can make them an urn for a loved one. And then they'll send me the dirt uh, from where that person was from. And I'll mix it in with the clay. Or if there's clay available, I'll just make it out of that clay. But, um, yeah, the idea of just making an object that's going to hold the remains of someone um, that's pretty intense. That's a, that's a strong process of making. This piece is almost entirely uh, about making. Um, it's, it's just wood logs that uh, I was just responding to the grain, the shape of the tree, uh, how they were going to balance together. Once again, no preconceived idea. But as, you work, as I worked with it, and really I worked with it over a long period of months, allowing the wood to dry, cracks to reveal themselves. Um, and that's how I like to approach wood if I have the time, to let it um, run its course as it dries out in my studio, whether it's a year. Uh, it's also because I get distracted and I have to keep coming back to it. But um, it's just stacked charred logs. Uh, it's about so high. But, um, yeah, just purely responding to the material itself. This is an interesting piece in terms of making. Um, this is a massive block of glass. Uh, these are all about three quarter inch layers of uh, low iron glass that I uh, laminated with optical epoxy. It's about, oh, well, it's 75 inches tall. Um, so it's pretty big. It's really, really heavy. And it was a, uh, a piece I set out to do, I set out to make, and learned some serious lessons making. Clearly, uh, something happened uh, where it cracked in the end. And this was a piece that was entirely designed ahead of time. Um, it was engineered. Uh, it, was, uh, it was intended to be fabricated by someone that understood glass. Um, and uh, it, no one would build it for me. So with my uh, ignorance and, I guess, ego, I decided I would build it. I would make it. And uh, it was a very expensive mistake, although it's a beautiful piece now. I, I've really come to appreciate the cracks and what they represent. Uh, it's a very heavy piece to keep in my studio. It's, I, I still don't have a home for it or know where it's going to go. But it's incredible to actually see and to see in person. It's uh, two hemispherical voids carved into this block of glass that um, visually they, they kind of <coughs> respond to your position and approach, as well as uh, acoustically. The sound is projected differently. Um, what was interesting is this crack happened at the very end, the very last layer that goes on. And I, w I probably wouldn't have finished the piece if the crack happened sooner. 
but that's part of making is, uh, you know, I'd say there's at least a 70% failure rate with making. Um, unfortunately, it happened with a very expensive, expensive heavy piece, but with the smaller pieces, I just assume if I continue to make at least, you know, 10% of those are going to be worth showing and keeping. It's just like anything else, making dinner. Um, a lot of them are not going to be so good. Uh, <laughs> making songs. I know a few musicians in the room that, uh, you know, you, you have to make 10 of them to get one good one. Um, so yeah, this was a really interesting piece for me and uh, my assistant at the time. I know it really affected the way he went about projects on his own and uh, you know, even just remodeling his house from there on out. We both, uh, we learned an incredible amount from this. And uh, yeah, who else would do this? Who else would laminate this big of a block of glass to let it crack? So if you ever want to see, <laughs> see it in person, come on by. Um, and it has led to other works. <laughs> This is a piece I recently uh, made in glass. Um, it's a lot more delicate, uh, and it kind of it has a has a relationship to the string works too. But the idea of these drawing drawing these lines through layers of glass that collect the light and uh, expose a form through those lines uh, in this void of darkness. Um, so I learned a little bit with glass from the other piece, and um, I'm working much smaller. This is only about uh, 12 by 12, <coughs> so it's a much smaller piece, but um, yeah. This brings me to the, uh, the windmill project, which was also very, very much about light. It's really all about light and the wind. Um, this is a landscape installation I started in, well, I started in Iceland. But this photograph's taken from about half a mile away. This was in the Vail Valley in 2007. And these are all light generating windmills. A still image doesn't necessarily do it justice. I have a video coming up. But each one of these little units um, generates a quality of light depending on the speed and the force of wind. And they fade in and out. So in a way they're almost digitizing the wind. And from a distance you'll see these waves and swells of light. And, uh, you know, the making in this process started in Iceland, collecting uh, refrigerator fan blades and uh, the generators off bicycles that, uh, we don't use them as much in America, but in Europe, everyone uses these to power the lights on their uh, bicycles. And then sticks from the lumber yard and uh, little bulbs and just making these in my bedroom, planting them in the landscape. I'd literally hike out there with them on my back and just, uh, find the location to see how, th how the wind's behaving against that hillside or in that valley. Uh, to see what it's like to introduce this man-made system into the landscape, into the natural elements, really just for the sake of seeing the wind. Uh, um, at this time, it was 2000, so the idea of clean energy was kind of in the periphery for me. Really, I, that wasn't the point of this piece. It was, it was all about seeing the <coughs> wind. and seeing how this element, what that fingerprint of technology or my handmade uh, object, what, how that shows up in the landscape at night. Um, it did eventually get to a point where there was a lot of design involved. Uh, and uh, the little box there, uh, it's not detailed, but that represents a, this, this fingerprint, um, this translation. It's not a computer or a programmed element, but it's a transformer, a series of circuits that that's, that creates the quality of light you see, uh, the, the sensitivity of it. And that's what's interest to me, interesting to me in these pieces now is what that one object is doing to create uh, the experience that, uh, you know, you can walk through it. It's like a grove or a forest of these uh, swelling lights. Yeah, it, it, from afar you start to see the behaviors of the wind in a, a very different characteristic but also to be in this grove or this field of uh, light generating windmills and seeing the wind pass over you as you feel it. And I was afraid you could kind of see, it's still a little light in here. Um, you could kind of see the, the waves of light, but unfortunately, it's just a very dark video. Go online. Go online, or you could come up here and watch it after. <laughs> uh, uh, who, who asked that? You, Patrick. Um, no, it, right now it's in storage. I still install it. Um, 
Last time I installed it was in Vermont in 2009. So it's been a while. But uh, it kind of, it, it's about finding the right location where um, people are excited about it. It is a lot of work. It's like the string installations, you know, it's just a week or two of installing these, uh, plugging, planting these elements into the landscape. Um, yeah, it's kind of intensive that way. This is a piece here in Denver, uh, also about light, but in this case it's, it's reflecting the light, the sky behind you. Uh, this is on the uh, train trestle at the end of Delgany there by the Museum of Contemporary Art. It's just a series of stainless steel rods that uh, glows depending on the position of the light in the sky and where you're at. It, it also disappears, so some of you may have walked right under it and not noticed. In the morning, it has a very different appearance. Um, but yeah, it, what it's doing is just reflecting that chromatic shift um, that's behind you. And uh, in the case of making this, uh, you know, it's a very simple construction. It's just stainless steel rods welded in place. Uh, but it was a piece that, once again, like the string installations, uh, after making it, it showed me what it was actually going to do and going to be tried to anticipate and hope it would work well and reflect, but uh, just the nuances and the subtleties that I see throughout the day and different times of the year. It's great to live near where some of your projects go in. You know, this is something I can walk on on my own very easily and enjoy. This is, uh, this introduces the last project I'm going to talk about, and this is just a charcoal sketch of a, a shadow array that I'm going to be installing at DIA. Um, they've given me a valley, basically. It's an enormous space. Um, let's see. That, uh, that will uh, <coughs> accommodate the train coming in. Um, this will be the view from basically the, the new hotel, uh, looking south. And uh, after gathering what I could, as far as information about the site, because it doesn't exist yet, uh, but I know the Colorado Plains, I know the Eastern uh, Plains, you know, our region. And I know that there's a tremendous amount of solar exposure here at this site. And I felt like uh, casting shadows was going to be my strongest opportunity, and I started working that way. Um, what I've created is an array of logs. These are going to be spruce logs, uh, infested, beetle infested, or beetle kill logs from our mountains here that uh, will all be calibrated, positioned, cut, and assembled to cast the shadow arrays. And once you look past the logs, you start to see these bands of shadow that are really about, it's almost a moray effect or a superimposed uh, effect where the logs themselves are interrupting the, uh, the shadows. So you, you start to see these radiating bands that, that respond to your position or where you're at. Um, this is the site, well, it's actually a few months ago, but this is what it looks like right now. And if you've traveled, you've probably driven by it. Um, it's a very different project in terms of making because it really, it's entirely designed right now. Uh, the site doesn't exist. I can't respond to much more than what you see here. Um, so, uh, you know, with the public art commissions, you have to design a certain amount anyway, just for the sake of approvals and it's like building a building. It's <laughs> not just going to make it in place and hope that it works. So what's exciting now is to uh, step back from this location to this location where the making will begin. And um, this is from the Rio Grande Forest near Del Norte, Colorado, where we've located just a huge amount of very tall, dead spruce trees that uh, need to be cut down anyway. So over the next few months, I've aligned with a forester that's going to start bringing these down and delivering them. And that's when we'll start making this. That uh, if you take the train, you'll come in and uh, you'll see it that way. You'll see it from the air as well. You'll see it from uh, the hotel or the public plaza. There'll be a public area right about here that everyone will have access to. You won't have to stay in the hotel <laughs> to see it because um, I don't think that's going to be a cheap room. Um, and, uh, but even coming in on the train, you'll have this corn row effect. This, uh, it's going to respond to the speed that you're, you're arriving or departing. Um, 
in the evening it will be illuminated, but I can just imagine uh, the snow, what the snow is going to do for this piece and uh, different times of the year. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm excited for you guys to probably in about two years get to experience this piece. It's going to take a while. But uh, I can o open it up to questions now and uh, conversation. Yes? No, we're going to let them let them just dry out and age and silver out or gray out <coughs> the way that wood does. There's a lot of reasons why I didn't want to treat them or an add a preservative, but uh, I think sculpturally it's just going to work out better too. And that because they're elevated from the ground, there's really there's no reason for the sculpture to have a preservative. If it was a light pole, it probably should be preserved. So. Yeah. The one I showed was actually, uh, what I had in mind was a modular shape in the event of, I uh, was kind of responding to the, the, not the Japanese tsunami, but the first tsunami in Indonesia, that uh, uh, just the idea of that many people dying at once and almost building a building out of these urns that would then disintegrate. That's why that one looks the way it does, but uh, each one has kind of been different. If you don't make? If you don't make. Well, I mean, for me, I think there's a disengagement with a soul <laughs> or a, a, a spirit. That, I mean, I, I feel the need to make. Not everyone feels that. I think it's a human, um, human desire, a, 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 something we all possess. But I've known plenty of people that have had to uh, resign the role of making, at least in their careers, you know, because of whatever, that's where they've ended up. Um, I hope that outside of their job, they're making, whether it's making dinner. But I think it does fulfill a very important part of our lives. Uh, I fortunately get to do it all the time. Um, but I also have to pay very close attention to it. There's, a, there's more at stake personally with making than me. And um, maybe that's why I'm not a good cook. I, I, I'm trying to make it <laughs> into art. Instead of just eat it, um, you know, but, yeah. I don't know. And, I, and I almost, I want to ask the question of all you guys, too. I think it is an interesting, you know, that's why the question today was, what are you making, but, or what are you not making? Or um, uh, maybe you have an idea of how to answer that question, too. As an employer, I would almost want to see, if I was asking my, uh, my workforce to, kind of disengage from making during the day, I'd want to see what they are making because the outside of work, just that's, that's going to complement how they're approaching everything else. I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I know there are companies that encourage that. Not that there's a shop class on Fridays or anything. But, um, and I don't think you necessarily have to get three-dimensional or use your hands. That's personally for me to get tactile is important, but um, there are ways to make digitally and uh, you know, synthetically without getting glue on your hands. You know. Yes? Now that's what's interesting about that project is it started before I started thinking about those things. And each time I install it, there is that conversation. You know, automatically it's attached to wind energy which I, I appreciate and I encourage. I want people talking about that. I'm not necessarily comfortable with the way in that wind energy has entered the landscape. Um, there's a man I was talking to that grew up in Iowa and he was kind of lamenting that there's nowhere he can look now and see just horizon like when he was growing up. There's a windmill everywhere, 360 view. He can find one windmill. And that's kind of sad. Um, but it's also clean. It, it, it works well. Uh, I think there's a, a way to approach it. Um, making art is not efficient. And if you're trying to make energy, it's all about efficiency. So uh, I run a very highly inefficient <laughs> profession. Um, I've tried to get better at it to uh, financially do better. But uh, <laughs> I don't see that happening. Um, but yeah, with the windmills, they, there's motivation to make them as big as they are and uh, place them where they are. But I think there, there's a balance there. And, um, 
right now it seems like a really, uh, well, once again, egotistical. Usually the way that industry approaches nature and the landscape, we kind of have an ego. And I'd like to see a little more sensitivity with that. More questions? I, I, I always try to consider it. I have an aversion to plastics. Oh. Um, it's just personal taste. I think they certainly play a role in products and what we do. But uh, I mean, for this piece, I did consider a lot of different materials. I was thrilled when I uh, got the approval to use wood. Um, I don't. I think this is actually the first time I've done a public art piece that I can use wood, and it's the biggest piece I've ever done. But um, yeah, there, I mean, synthetic materials work. There's a reason why they've been developed. They just. Uh, I don't, I don't see what I need in plastics and stuff, so. Is that time to cut it? Yeah. I think we should. Okay. Yeah. Get to work. Go back to work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.